church fam, this is Ben, and I am excited to be talking to you for this uh, Life Right Now series that we're doing as a staff. The question I have been asked to help answer for us is, how can I grow as a worshiper? And one of the things that I just want to clarify right off the bat is, obviously our whole lives are an offering of worship to God, but when people ask me this question, they're usually talking about how do I grow in my boldness? How do I grow in my freedom? How do I grow in my expression of our corporate times of worship, uh, which take place uh, when we gather together and when we sing? And I think this is a great question and it's super relevant too right now. Um, the last year has just been super heavy. I think we can just all admit we've, we've, we've been broken at the personal level. We've been broken at the national level. Um, we've even experienced brokenness uh, in our church family and we, we're grieving things that we don't get to enjoy and things that we've lost. And sometimes that can disconnect us from the heart of worship. More than half of our church family isn't able to worship with us in person on a Sunday morning. We wear masks. Many of us are worshiping from an online forum and sometimes it feels like it's difficult to grow as a worshiper when you have all these restrictions. and So my heart really is today just to talk about some things that have been really helpful for me uh, to think about in terms of growing as a worshiper throughout my life. And so I want to focus on two areas. And the first is uh, an area of growth for us and a challenge of growth for us is we have to cultivate intentionality and we have to cultivate expectation uh, when we come to worship God. And I actually want to reference a scripture passage in 1 Chronicles 17.1, it says, After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is housed in a tent. And I want to give a little context to that. Uh, King David is oftentimes, uh, he's, he's one of the people that we look to as, as one of the biggest scriptural role models of what it means to be a wholehearted worshiper of the Lord. Um, and in this time, David had actually just, uh, he had had several huge victories. Um, Saul wasn't trying to hunt him down and kill him anymore. Uh, he had defeated the Philistines. He had actually gone and reclaimed the Ark of the Covenant, um, and uh, which the Israelites believed housed the presence of the Lord, and, and won it back from the Philistines, and he had brought it back to Jerusalem. Uh, he had started to rebuild the city. He was crowned king. And it seemed like for most people, they would just kind of rest back on their laurels at that point and just kind of settle into comfort. But David actually feels a deep injustice in his soul, even when everything is going right. And the truth is, David had just finished building his palace in 1 Chronicles 17, and that's the house of cedar he's referring to. But the presence of God and the Ark of the Covenant was housed in a mobile tent. And David thought this was not right. David actually, uh, he goes on to say in Psalm 132, he swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob and said, uh, this is David, I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. So David believed in the power of intentionality and the worship of God. Uh, he didn't settle into his comforts. He believed that God was worthy of creating an intentional and sacred space uh, to be experienced. And so even it goes on in scripture to say all of the, the meticulous detail that David designed the space that God was to be worshipped. And once it was completed, the temple became the cultural epicenter of people experiencing and placing worth on the presence of of God. And it's all because David drew a boundary, he drew a line in the sand that said, uh, I will not retreat into my comforts, I won't retreat into the apathy and, and, the, and the fatness of, of victory, I'm going to create a resting place for the presence of God. So I think that's incredibly important for us, I'll speak on that a little bit later, uh, but I also want to talk on uh, the concept of expectation. So here's the truth. I mean, intentionality required is the actions that we take when preparing to worship God. Uh, but expectation is the heart posture that we carry when we go to worship God. So we can do all the right things. We can show up to church early. We can uh, you know, create a really sacred space in terms of all the aesthetics uh, to worship God. But if we don't bring a heart of expectation, uh, then something, something is empty. 
uh, in that. And so we see that with David. David did not only have intentionality in the atmosphere that he created to worship God, he carried expectation. He knew that the space that he built would be filled by the Spirit of God. And that's something uh, that we have to carry with us on Sundays too. So I want to speak a little bit, I, you know, to what that practically looks like for us today when we are going to worship on a Sunday. Uh, on a Sunday or another opportunity. And actually, I want to share a story. There's a young man in our church family who, whom I dearly love, uh, and several years ago, he got the opportunity to go to an amazing Christian conference in Miami, and there were some national names there speaking, um, some nationally uh, kind of known and renowned uh, worship teams were leading worship there, and he just had a phenomenal experience. Like, God met him every session, morning, noon, and night. He came back different. Uh, he came back hungry. Uh, and we, we talked, and he, afterwards, and I was kind of, you know, picking his brain about what was good about the conference, and he said, I felt like my heart was so activated. I was so engaged. Uh, even in the morning times when I'm usually dead, uh, I felt like God was meeting me there on a regular basis. And then he said this, I don't feel that at church. Why don't I feel that at church? And we had a great conversation uh, about expectation and intentionality. Turns out when you, when you expect something great from God, uh, when you're going to worship him, uh, when you prepare your heart, when you've actually put resources, I mean, he paid for this conference. Uh, uh, when, he, when you arrive on time, uh, it turns out that God opens doors to work in your life. These are some of the ways that we can be the most intentional about uh, coming to worship. This is one of the biggest ways you can grow as a worshiper right now is start to draw a line in the sand about how intentional you are coming to praise him. The first thing you do is just show up early uh, to church. I think we've all been there where um, we want to worship God, but then something interjects in our timeline in the morning and you know, something goes wrong. We didn't plan that buffer time and then we're walking in 15 minutes late and we're like, oh, you know, get, get everything settled. And then the last song is finishing and we feel this deflation of like, ah, I don't feel like I met with God in worship today. And one of the best things we can do is, is cultivate sacred space with your time. Get that 30 minute buffer of when you need to leave in the morning so that you can come on time and maybe not just on time, but early. I even recommend to people like, go sit in the space that you're about to worship and pray before you're about to worship and invite God to fill your heart and fill your praise before the first song even starts. For those of us who are online, and actually this applies to people who are coming in person as well, get some sleep beforehand. Worshiping God is, is our primary purpose in life. It's kind of like when we go to Sundays, think of it, you're going to work in a sense. It's a joyful thing. Get some sleep and you'll feel more energized from the morning. And the final thing I would say about intentionality is if you're worshiping from home, uh, create a space that excludes distractions. I know it's tempting, but don't eat when you're worshiping. Uh, give God that full attention. Don't do breakfast at the whole time. Let that space be sacred space that's given to the Lord. Families, I know that this is really hard, um, but create that buffer time. Uh, maybe have breakfast before, you know, you could watch at 11, 11 a.m. and have some breakfast before. And just take a quick time to pray with your family before church. Pray over uh, the situations that have happened that week that are hard and uh, pray that God would meet each individual family member uh, in a really profound way that touches them where they're at. So intentionality and expectation. When we believe God for, for great things, when we do the legwork of, of setting apart that space and that time for him, you should be amazed at how he moves. And the second thing that I want to talk to us about is we have to move from an observer to becoming a participant. What's not commonly known by people in the American church is that the word that we translate to praise uh, actually is seven different Hebrew words, seven different actions that we've kind of summed up into this one word praise in the translation. And every single one of them is demonstrative. They're not passive. And what we need to know is that worship is demonstrative. One doesn't just experience worship. We give worship. We demonstrate worship with our bodies, with our body posture, with our voices, with our hearts, with our minds, uh, with our eyes. Uh, we were created to demonstrate uh, God's worth. We live in a consumer culture. Uh, everything, I mean, everything in our lives really has been marketed to us 
uh, for us to experience, um, for, for us to consume, and for us to enjoy. So everything from your food to your TV to, uh, we've even learned how to consume people. Uh, if you look at Instagram, like we, we've learned how to consume and receive benefits from uh, and kind of glean off of other people's lives and their personas. And everything in culture reinforces that instinct in us and and sadly that instinct has that has been nurtured and I, I mean that in a negative way uh, by culture has bled into the way that we approach church it's bled into the way that we approach worship there's a difference between watching worship and worshiping there's a difference between listening to a song and being entertained by it and worshiping and the difference is your voice your song, your heart lifted to God. So one of the things that we can do to move from being an observer to a participant uh, is, is sing. Is sing along, even if you don't feel like you're very good. And one of the things that you can do, I mean, bodily expression is huge as well. I and mean, we, we oftentimes lift our hands uh, in church. And that's not something we do just when the bridge of the third song hits real hard and taps into our heart. Like we lift our hands in the sanctuary of God because he's worthy. Um, before we even feel it, we make a declaration with our bodies uh, that God is worthy, that he is kind, and he is above all. Worship wasn't designed to be a burden on us. Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Moving from an observer in worship to a participant isn't just another responsibility to stress you out. It actually brings freedom to your heart and it brings freedom to your experience with Jesus. I hope that this has been helpful for you. Uh, these are things that I've worked through, I'm still working through. Come intentional, come expecting something and come with the mindset that you are going to participate in the worship of God rather than observe it. And I guarantee uh, you will experience growth. You will see the move of God in your times of worship. Love you guys, and uh, looking forward to worshiping with you guys soon. Check it out.